Okay, Dad, today is Friday, September 20th, and let's start off by talking about the Middle East. Um, is the conflict in between Israel and Hezbollah, has it now officially escalated to the state of of a war, open war? I mean, what is the, how do you assess the current <laughs> conflict situation right now? Well, it looks like, yeah, we're we're on the verge of a war, the beginnings of a war. The, 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 it seems that Russia, uh, not Russia, but Israel, the IDF is making, um, you know, the, the pl preliminary moves that you often see prior to a full-scale invasion. Um, you know, we had the, the wave of pager attacks and then the walkie-talkie attacks. We can get into that in more detail later. But then there's there actually have been, I think, a couple of limited incursions, you know, probably more of a, um, a reconnaissance nature, They're just probing, uh, uh, you know, with the purpose of probing uh, Hezbollah defenses. And then there's been significant bombing, um, including today uh, a strike on Beirut that took out a building, and apparently in that building was a very high-ranking uh, Hezbollah commander, uh, at least one. And there, there are different stories, that one, two, all the way up to 20. Um, none of that has been confirmed. Israel is, is claiming that they did kill their main target. This high-ranking commander is the head of a, an, an elite um, Hezbollah unit. Hezbollah hasn't confirmed it. I mean, Hezbollah generally it has a record of being honest about their losses. So if indeed he was killed, I think we'll we'll find out about that soon. Um, but anyway, yeah, these are, it almost seems sort of like a shock and awe kind of campaign that they, the Israelis are carrying out. And, and in the meantime, they are moving their forces or ground forces right up to the, the Lebanese border. And, um, um, yeah, the IDF, well, the, the Minister of Defense Gallant has said that, he said quite clearly just a day or I think a couple of days ago that the, the that the focus is being shifted to the north, and I, th I think I think his exact words that the center of gravity of their military operations is shifting to the north. So this is the gallant that that Netanyahu was supposedly so upset about for dragging his feet. He's still there, and he actually seems to be prepared to carry out. You know, and it, do you think that's kind of why he's still there? That maybe Netanyahu said, "Hey, look, if you don't do this, then I'm sacking it, you and putting in this it could be. Yeah, hey, yeah, he." You know, again, uh, Netanyahu is a very wily politician, and maybe you know he just put his feet to the fire, and and so now it's happening. Uh, yeah, we'll find out. Um, yeah, there are other rumors. He said, you know, the story was that you know that Gallant wasn't um, uh, eager enough, you know, to 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 carry out the northern campaign, which is to say the Lebanese campaign. You know that that was the reason that Netanyahu was was angry with him and wanted to replace him. But then there are, there are other rumors that say it may have more to do with domestic politics. This replacement, um, Netanyahu, who I think could figure could help him in bolstering his position domestically. But who knows? It's probably all those things at once. You know, that's a, the way, a, you know, a, a crafty politician like Netanyahu works. You said that Israel is enacting a shock and awe campaign. What does that mean exactly? That they're just going to overwhelm the, the Lebanese forces and just everybody will hope to have them just cower in fear what what is the what's yeah the, well of course you know that refers shock, back no? to the the um the, the first time i heard that term was used was prior to the iraq war in uh 2003 it began with a series of strikes you know actually an attempted an attempt to assassinate saddam hussein they took out a building where they thought that he might be the the u.s forces did um, it turned out he wasn't there, but they killed a number of other people. Um, uh, yeah, this was shock and awe. You know, the, the idea was just to, I think, to throw the command structure into disarray, to create panic, so panic. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it's again, there are, there's, there's a lot of questions about these um, pager and other uh, mobile communication device explosions, but possibly they were part of the of a shock and awe kind of campaign. You know, it certainly did create a lot of panic. I think in the end, it's actually not going to help the is, oops, for some so reason. It. Yeah, okay. Yeah, for some reason, um, well, anyway, um, it did create momentary panic, but I don't think it really did uh, significantly degrade Hezbollah's communications network. And it, it did kill some Hezbollah commanders, but um, um, 
But again, you know, Hezbollah was left largely, its command structure was left largely intact. So just looking at it in a strategic sense, you know, or, you know, a pure military sense, it was not successful. Uh, and I think, to be honest, I think that it may have uh, proved to, um, to, if anything, have uh, bolstered Hezbollah's position within Lebanese society. You know, we were, we were talking about how, in, in a lot of ways, it's actually not not what what they did there had perhaps more justification, or or was less cruel, less barbaric than a lot of things that Israel has done. Certainly in Gaza and in, and in Lebanon too, um, uh, but for whatever reason, it's just it's. I think it really it's just the 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 scenes of. Um, you know, explosions occurring in shopping centers and in cars and whatever really terrified people. And I think it got to them in a way that sometimes even the the, the image of a completely pancaked, you know, um, a residential building or apartment building doesn't get to people for some reason. You know, they just see this pile of rubble and they don't understand sometimes, well, that maybe there were 10 families in there, but they don't see them. But it's just these these images, I guess, because it's such we're talking about such common everyday objects, you know, mobile communications devices that we all carry around. It, it's, it really, you know, terrified people. Um, and it had certainly had, you know, that effect within Lebanon in general. You know, one thing that we haven't talked about earlier is that um, Hezbollah is is not just constrained by, you know, the um by the IDF, by its, you know, its relative power and ability to retaliate. It has to consider its position within Lebanese society. It is not a state actor. It's a kind of a sub-state actor. Um, and it does have to, it's it's part of the Lebanese government, you know, part of a wider Lebanese society. And um, much of Lebanon was, you know, less, is really very reluctant to get in, involved in a war. Now, you know, Hezbollah made this commitment to, to support um, the Palestinians of Gaza, you know, I think which is a very moral commitment, but not all of Lebanon went along with that. But this this incident actually seems to have galvanized support for Hezbollah within Lebanon. You had the Lebanese president coming out and saying, basically, we support um, Hezbollah, you know, unconditionally. They, they you know, they need to, to fight back and, and let them decide how to do it. Uh, and you weren't getting statements like that before. So it may have, you know, there was a very clever attack. You know, obviously it was ingenious. It, 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 uh, it required a lot of foresight, a lot of planning. You know, some of the reports are that it actually was 15 years in the making. Right. In the end, you know, it, in fact, it just, it, it, it may not have it rather, if you look at it strategically, it was, probably a great bust if anything. Mm -hmm. It just, it, it really didn't hurt, hurt them, um, has lost significantly in military terms and has strengthened them politically. And it's just, you know, they're right. just, well, just yeah, the, the, like you were saying, just the visual of it, it just comes off as a terrorist attack. You know, the idea of somebody walking into a shop and blowing themselves up, you know, I mean, this is, you had kind of many, versions of that all throughout Lebanon, thousands right. of people, people going around their daily, daily lives. So I can see that, you know, we, we, we were talking about debating, like, is this a valid uh, attack carried out by the IDF? Um, but regardless, you know, I, 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 I do think that it is, it does border terrorism. You know, it's mm -hmm. hard to know exactly who yeah. was holding all these things, especially. Yeah. Well, they, they knew they were, they knew they were going to kill a lot of civilians. You know, that's there's no question about it. Right. And it's just throughout a heavily populated center. Right. So, you know, it is going to create terror and panic. So um, I can see how that the, uh, the Lebanese people would rally behind um, Hezbollah and say, yeah, we got to stop this. This is terrifying. Everybody's got a smartphone. Everybody's got something. And if you're just a regular Lebanese person um, in, the, in Beirut, it's you'd have to be freaking out. Just don't touch my phone. Don't touch yeah. anything. I'm going to stay offline. Um, uh -huh. You know, because who knows if there's like said 15 years in the making, how many other devices could the, of Israel have put explosives into into your into your yeah. microwave, into your TV, whatever. Yeah. You know, you can see that paranoia going through. So yeah, it, no. Um, and, and within Lebanon, I don't think it would be unjustified. I think I would be rather paranoid. Yeah. Um, it, <laughs> 
Yeah, like we said, it, you know, it was ingenious, and in some ways, it was slightly, it was targeted towards Hezbollah. But obviously, these devices got into other people. Yeah. But if you just try to look at it in any other situation, if any other country did this, right, right. it would be right. viewed as a terrorist attack, right? Sure. Would, that's right. Again, I'm saying it's actually it's less barbaric than a lot of what Israel does, but it's still barbaric, you know. It's, right. It's just yeah. We, when, when and when I I was watching the news the other day. Ever the the main U.S. media is just heaping praise on, on this attack, just especially Fox News, just how yeah. incredible it was. These guys are so awesome, and then and it's it's funny how we're able to do that and say like this is fantastic. But then mm -hmm. when um, the Hezbollah strikes back, you know, military targets with the with their missiles, they are the terrorists for some reason. Mm -hmm. You know, or the October seventh yeah. attack; those are all just terrorists no idea of you know obviously there's atrocities committed and civilians it's really citizens civilians were, were slaughtered um not condoning it at all but no no not being able to put it into perspective at all mm -hmm. i think that these guys are you know uh, under yeah. occupation and are breaking out the, the people um but that's we, we know that that that's just how it's always framed um so anyway since this has been going on in the past 48 72 hours it seems like all the action has been the IDF inflicting damage upon Hezbollah and, and the Lebanese. We've had the pager attacks, walkie-talkies, bombings, incursions into southern Lebanon. Have we seen anything from Hezbollah? Are they just biding their time, waiting for the dust to settle, and then should uh -huh. we expect something? What's, uh, um, what's the situation? Uh, there have been, you know, uh, rocket attacks. That's, you know, not on a particularly large scale, you know, maybe larger than usual. Um, but nothing that we, you could call a massive retaliation. So they really haven't done very much. Um, I think they're, they're waiting for, and probably hoping, uh, that the Israelis are going to begin a ground invasion. And the Israelis seem, appear to be poised to do that, which again, seems very foolish, but I, I guess they, they understand that they have to. Uh, because the stated objective of this, you know, attack on on Hezbollah is to restore uh, security to the, you know, the, the northern part of Israel. There are some tens of thousands, you know, you, you hear numbers ranging from 60,000 to 200,000 Israelis that have been evacuated. And, you know, that's a constant source of, I think, both, you know, embarrassment and it's a domestic political pressure that, that, um, uh, Netanyahu has to deal with, and, and one thing is to you know he I, I again we've always uh, you know the Israelis have always prided themselves or they they're they're the raison d'être I mean their very reason for existence has been uh, stated reason for existence is to supply uh, provide a safe place for Jews and say well you can't do that in the north right. And so he's got to reestablish that. But to do that, if he's actually he's going to have to extirpate Hezbollah, some you know, in from southern Lebanon, and uh, no amount of bombing is going to do that. Um, I think that they have to try a ground invasion, and again, probably the hope is to bring in the U.S. to provide um, air support. But and of course, they've this, got their own air support. Do you think this is a realistic objective? Is it achievable? I mean, they would have I to don't. put. They'd yeah, have to I push maybe. them back very far, and then they what they would just annex that territory of southern Lebanon. But then all of a sudden, that new annex region, you're, you're going to constantly have this line of conflict. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, they've tried that twice in the past. Once was 1982, 1983, you know, the invasion of Lebanon. That um, uh, they went all the way up to Beirut, but then just gradually retreated. They tried to hold on to some territory you know, in the southern, uh, very southern part of Lebanon, but eventually pulled out from that there too in 2000. I think that they might hold some very small amounts of land still, the Israelis. Um, I, I think they still occupy a little bit of Lebanese territory, but they uh, basically um, abandoned all that territory that they, they seized during the 1982-1983 um, the invasion. And then they, they tried again in 2006, and that failed actually rather rapidly. I mean, it was the first one actually 
was responsible for the the first invasion in the 80s, was responsible for the creation of Hezbollah. Hezbollah was created in response to that invasion. And Hezbollah and other forces eventually drove um, the Israelis out. They just made them pay a price, you know, um, too high a price. You know, they, they decided that they, they kind of like the, the Americans in Vietnam, said this just isn't worth it. We just, you know, this was... Uh, um, you say we could stay, we could, you know, we do have the means to remain, you can maintain a presence here, but we are, uh, uh, the whole project is becoming increasingly unpopular at home, you know, and within the IDF itself, uh, in the end, they decided it just wasn't worth it and they pulled out. In 2006, they really actually were um, defeated uh, militarily, you know, and they only, after a month, they pulled back. They just, a lot of their tanks were destroyed by Hezbollah units that uh, used very, very clever tactics against them. Um, so I don't, I don't see, I mean, they don't have a, they haven't succeeded in the past. I, I really don't know what they're thinking, but it may be, again, this may be um, yet Netanyahu's big gamble. I mean, he's not, he knows that he can't really defeat uh, Hezbollah in uh, southern Lebanon, but maybe he hopes by attacking them, he can draw Iran into a war, and that's what he wants. And then when Iran's there, then he'll have the U.S. fighting Iran, and that's his, you know, that's his, his plan. That's what he's been um, shooting for all along. So you said that there were um, previous invasions into Lebanon in the 1982-1983, and then in 2006. What is different about this time? He's a lot of people that are casual observers of the war. They might just say, well, the Middle East is always popping off. They're always shooting rockets at each other. Is there something specific, different about the situation we're in now as opposed to all these previous conflicts since the creation yeah. of the state of Israel? Well, yeah, we've talked about it. There's just, um, there has been a gradual shift in power um, in favor of, of Iran and Hezbollah and to the detriment of Israel. You know, Israel still is a, 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 a great power, a you know, military power to be reckoned with. Um, but they they don't have the overwhelming power that they once had. Um, and I think we actually, you know, we saw it in 2006. It 2000, you know, in the 1980s, they, they did maintain that occupation for, you know, approximately 17 years before, before pulling out in 2000. They were just worn down. It's just, it, it was clear that, um, you know, there was it, the um, their losses would never end, even if their losses were weren't very serious on a you know a weekly or a monthly basis. They were constant, and finally they decided they just couldn't afford to keep on paying that price and left. Um, but when they tried in two thousand six, they found a much more sophisticated Hezbollah army, and um, one that um, had had worked out tactics um, and had acquired weapons, even if you know that were. Uh, able to inflict very serious damage on the ground forces. And they quickly, you know, the Israelis got a very bloody nose and just and after a month pulled out. Um, and now they've had 14 years since then. And then during that time, you know, Iran has grown increasingly powerful and it's been worked at, you know, building up its missile arsenal that we talked about. And this Iran that used to be very isolated, you know, thanks really in large part to Israeli efforts, is, uh, through the U.S., you know, to sanction and isolate um, Iran is no longer isolated. It's part of BRICS and has a very, you know, it's supported by China and it has a very close um, economic and diplomatic and military relationship with Russia. Um, it, it is a, a much, you know, it's a force to be reckoned with. And it, there, 20 years ago, um, Iran was very weak relative to Israel. Israel today, I think, understands that they could actually, if on a, if it was just uh, uh, a fight between the two countries, Israel and Iran, Israel probably could not win. And Iran, you know, has, they might very well lose to, to Iran. Uh, but, you know, that's a different situation. And now, uh, so, so it's just the, the, the larger context, you know, just the overall, um, situation geopolitical and military has shifted you know, steadily in favor of uh, Israel's enemies. And so they're going into this really in a, um, you know, already we have to remember too that this IDF that's going, that's going to go into Lebanon or appears poised to go into Lebanon is a, a, 
an army that has been fighting for almost a year now in Gaza. Um, and it's, you know, they're not fresh. They're worn down. Um, and um, it, the U.S. There is there to support them. But this is a U.S. too that has depleted a lot of its stockpiles, uh, both to Israel, but even more so to Ukraine over the last couple of years. It's just... Again, you know, these are powerful forces, the U.S. and Israel lined up, but they, they are weaker than they were even a couple of years ago, you know, while their their rivals are stronger. Uh, so it's it's just not going to, I think Israel knows that they can't win this. And they it may be that, I, I don't think there's any question about it, that the, it, Netanyahu is doing this, just knowing that they are believing that by doing so, he's going to draw in the United States. This is what he's wanted to happen all along for years and years. You know, this has been his plan. Um, Hezbollah is said to have upwards of 150,000 rockets and missiles. I don't think we know, an ex nobody knows the exact number. Yeah, but right. I, I hear that number often. So it, I suppose it's true. Right. Regardless um, and, of a very large number. And right. I, and Iran has shown as, as well as Hezbollah has shown that they can overwhelm the Israeli air defense systems pretty, pretty easily, actually. Um, and if they want to, and they also are quite precise. So if they want to hit uh, military targets within Israel, they can do it. So why hasn't Hezbollah done it? Like if you're Hezbollah, why don't they launch thousands and thousands of rockets and hit all of the Israeli airfields where these F-16s and F-35s are taking off at, hit their command centers, knock out their communications, their military command posts, the same way that Israel is doing to the Hezbollah right now. You know, you just said they're trying to do the shock and awe campaign. What it sounds like is that Hezbollah has the ability to also do a shock and awe campaign on Israel. Why are they holding back? Um, I think it probably is, you know, it's it's really about uh, perceptions and di um, uh, diplomatic relations. You know, in other words, they don't want to be perceived as the aggressor. They don't want to give Israel the excuse, which I think probably they um, th that uh, uh, Netanyahu has been seeking the the excuse of of the of being the victim. You you would like to. Uh, no matter what happens, you know, they always claim to be the victim. So even right. when it's quite, but, but it'll be much easier to portray themselves as a victim and, and get support from the U S um, and from other Western powers, such as, you know, France and Britain. If, um, if uh, Hezbollah went ahead and uh, did just what you described, if they carried out their own shock and awe campaign, you know, against Israel. Um, you, you know how it would be spun in the Western press and it would say, oh, you know, Israel is under attack. Is poor little Israel needs help from, you know, from its its few friends in the world, from France and, you know, UK. And it would be much easier, I think, to bring them in. And I think Hezbollah understands that. And, well, and so does Iran. But but I mean, it, it, but this would be in response to everybody around the world has been following this, the, the story about these pagers exploding, you know, a, mm -hmm. a clear attack. On Hezbollah, and then now the, these bombings in southern Lebanon and Beirut itself, um, and even incursions. So, you know, people. I think if they did some type of retaliation and hit these bases that that we're talking about, that I think it would be perceived by a lot of people. Well, yeah, this is a response to what Israel just did, and also we're talking. I'm talking about hitting simply military targets, hitting the military airfields, and this. I'm not talking about raining rockets down on Tel Aviv and destroying civilian centers. I feel like if they did that, you know, I I think people would see it as a proportional response. I mean, obviously, yeah, like we right. said in the US, Western media, no matter what they do, they're always going to say, portray Israel as the victim and, and Hezbollah as the terrorist. So if that's the case, then don't even engage. You're not catering to that group anyways. You know, they're not going to be on your side no matter what, right? You may be right. You know, I, I, I'm just... <laughs> Um, you know, I'm trying to put myself in, 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 in the shoes of a Hezbollah commander of Nasrallah or whatever. That's, this is, and to offer an explanation, that's the best I can give. But I think you may be right. I think we may have approached the point where if they responded, it really wouldn't harm their position, you know, uh, in, in relation to other nations and potential supporters. I think a lot yeah. of people are 
you know, on the side of Hezbollah, I'd say the majority of the world is um, now and, and, and is hoping that Hezbollah will prevail. You know, obviously the U.S. doesn't have that position and most, much of Western Europe. But, you know, I, I'm wondering if another possibility is that was this uh, campaign that, is, that Israel carried out with the pagers and knocking out the shock and awe campaign, as you described, perhaps it was effective and there is some disarray in um, Hezbollah and decision making is muddled right now? Could it have been more effective than we think? Um, well, yeah, I think it's certainly possible. I mean, that I don't know the extent to which they relied on the pagers, but it, you know, it was a significant part of their communication systems. As, um, I understand that actually they rely primarily on wired communications. You know, they have a lot of these, the system of tunnels and, and they have wires running through them, you know, cause that's about the only thing that's really completely hack proof. The closed um, group. Yeah. yeah. Closed net. Um, but, you know, they clearly did, um, did need a, a wireless system too, or it was, it was an important component of their general communication system. And, and this must have been thrown into some kind of disarray. I may, I don't know how long it'll take them to, to fall back on some, you know, um, standby system they had or some alternative systems. We'll have to find out. But I think that's a reasonable, assumption that this has created a certain amount of disorganization and you know the, and and then again there was just a strike that may have commil killed one of uh, the commander of one of their elite units that would be another blow um so yeah you know it just may be that the, um you know they they simply have to get their bearings you know reorganize um you know again they are I think everybody admits that they're very, actually very well organized, uh, a well-run organization. So I'm, I'm sure that they'll do that. But any organization that has been subjected to the blows that this organization has been subjected to in the last few days is, is going to, you know, is going to have a struggle, a struggle to, to, um, to regain its bearings and to, um, you know, restore the, the level of organization that it had before. Okay, well, do you think that this uh, conflict that's breaking out right now, is this, we talked about how that it was different from previous conflicts and that Israel no longer has the upper hand, that Iran and Hezbollah have really strengthened themselves militarily so that this, this will not likely play out like we've seen in previous conflicts when Israel has invaded its neighbors. Is this the war between Hezbollah, the axis of resistance and Israel? Would you say that this is existential now for Israel, that if they do not win this war, then Israel will no longer exist? Well, you know, I guess I couldn't wouldn't go quite that far. Um, you know, it may not be that quick, but it's going to be an obvious blow to their prestige. It's going to if they fail, you know, if they are clearly defeated, like they attempt a ground invasion invasion and that invasion quickly becomes, you know, um, um, sinks into a quagmire you know is the the idf begins to suffer you know major losses if that happens and there and israel is forced to retreat in short order yeah that's going to be a huge blow to their prestige and and therefore to um their uh highly valued uh deterrence capabilities i mean this is the world is going to see it you know in particular the arab world is going to see it and it's and and israel is going to feel more vulnerable than ever before it would be also regarded as a huge loss for netanyahu would put him in a very precarious position so this is quite a gamble for him if indeed you know he's going ahead with the land invasion it's a quite a gamble and i um but he just may think that this is he has to go for broke and that he feels confident that the U.S. will will step in on his side, um, and um, <laughs> will we? Then, yeah, then, yeah, then you know, who knows? The, then we just have a whole. Uh, we we really have a you know not quite World War Three, but we have a very major war on our hands. Will, will the U.S. step in? I think quite possibly. I think probably they will. I mean, if Israel is um, it, is clearly losing. See, maybe that's one reason too why um, Hezbollah, you know, wants wants to defeat Israel, but they don't want to make it look too bad. They don't want to give. They do not want the U.S. to enter the conflict. I mean, maybe they could take out a military base. This this is a difficult. I can imagine, you know, this is a kind of a difficult choice. You say, well, we want to inflict significant harm on this enemy, but if we inflict too much harm, then we bring in this bigger enemy. 
So what do we do? They have to thread the needle, right? Um, well, they have to defeat Israel at some point, right? Yeah, there's no do. way. There's right. no way for this conflict to be ended diplomatically, I believe, right? That there's this this, this oh, no. the powder yeah. cat has been ignited. It's yeah, we, you know, right. the, the, there's yeah, no. But do you do it by like say? I can just imagine like the play, like a, a some sort of major missile attack on Tel Aviv. Um, you, you know, even if civilian casualties are, you say, are fairly minimal, you know, you see uh, buildings on fire in the middle of Tel Aviv and, you know, the, the sirens wailing and whatever. This is going to be a huge blow to the Israeli uh, psyche and in general to the Zionist psyche. You know, this is, you know, we're all about, you know, creating a secure place. And here, right in the heart of our secure place, you know, there's no security. Um, and the calls for the U.S. to become involved at, it, at that point. Point, I think will become, if that happened, would become irresistible. That, you know, we, we cannot let this happen. You know, we remember, you know, this is like is, uh, the U.S. has committed itself to the Zionist project just as much as, as Israeli Zionists have. Well, what would it mean if we could get involved? In what capacity do you think it would just be I, naval I can't bombardments? Imagine, and... Yeah, I can't imagine that there'll be any actually boots on the ground. I think that's very unlikely, but it would just... You know, we have air assets and naval assets there, but I don't know really how much that can do. I mean, because that's again, uh, as uh, um, Hamas has demonstrated. I mean, you can just completely level cities, but still, if you've got this uh, underground bases, you know, the network of tunnels, you can continue to fight you can, and fight very effectively. So, do you see any way where Israel is victorious in this uh, conflict? Well, it's always possible. Again, you know, we're um, we're making assumptions on various reports we're getting from different sides, and and maybe um, Hezbollah is not as uh, strong as that we imagine. Maybe they, you know, the, those uh, those uh, hundred and fifty thousand missiles don't actually exist. Maybe they're fifty thousand. And it's still uh, enough. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe, you know, it depends on they, they're supposed to have, you know, they have a lot of these Katusha rockets, which are don't do a whole lot of damage. But if you've got 10,000 of them, you know, you can wreak a lot of havoc on a Let's see, on a small city. Clearly you can. Uh, but they claim to also have strategic missiles that could strike deep into Israel and, you know, Tel Aviv with uh, precision guidance systems. And, you know, again, we haven't seen them. Um, and we're assuming that they have them. I think they do, but, you know, we don't really know until what happens. And may, maybe, you know, again, Israel has shown that it's had some tricks up its sleeves. I think it was a couple of months ago that they had some sort of, they were claiming to have some sort of wonder weapon or, mm. and we're wondering what that was. You, you know, maybe it was, it? maybe it was the pagers, but maybe, you know, maybe there's more. You know, again, that was a surprise. In the end, I think strategically it didn't really achieve very much, but they might have. Again, you know, war is full is is full of unknowns, and um, you know the the opposing sides they they let they let certain facts be known, but they hide other facts. So we don't really know what's going to what you know what the, each side's capabilities are until a real war begins, and we'll find out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just based on what my understanding of it, it just does not look good for Israel and even for the, the U.S. I mean, it's not like the, the U.S. is vulnerable in a lot of ways for you know reasons that we described earlier. Um, it could obviously inflict a lot of damage, you know, especially on civilian structures, you know, but is that something we really want to do? Uh, but then its own, it has these military bases that are just like, you know, um, low hanging fruit for, for Iran and, um, you know, with its precision missiles. What's on the line for this con in this conflict for the United States? Like, if Israel loses this war, is dealt a severe defeat and blow. I mean, I mean, first of all, I don't understand what it, if, if if Israel's defeated. Does that just mean that they're not going to? It's it, that means it's going to get pushed out. It's the state's going to cease to exist. I don't see well, there any it way to go back I mean, to the, the state. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, <laughs> is there? Do you think that's possible that? After Hezbollah does a deals a severe defeat to uh, the IDF when they go do a ground invasion, do you think that Hezbollah is just going to stop there and say, "Okay, now we're going to go back to the 1967 line"? Like, well, what, what, what you know? Obviously, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of settlers living in the West Bank. Yeah. Like, 
what could we go to a situation where we say okay the un security council has finally ratified the two-state solution and sorry israel you got to move your settlements back your dreams of creating uh, greater israel have to stop it's done and do you think that the arab nations will just be like okay now it's it's done we, we may hate your guts but we're, we're going to respect these boundaries do you think that's even possible or once this war gets going and this is the the first time in a war that Israel might just be severely outmatched and there's so much hatred amongst all of their neighbors that they might just try to push them all out, right? Uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, well, one thing is, is still don't forget that they, Israel has the U.S. at its back and it has the, the U.S. in the U.N. So I just don't see uh, the, the, the U.N. Security Council actually you know, uh, passing a resolution like that. But it would be in the uh, United States' best interest to do it, to say, like, yeah, yes, well, we got to well, do it. Well, it would have been in to... the U.S.'s best interest to actually to constrain Israel months and months ago, years ago. But it's 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 not what the U.S. does. I mean, again, the shots are being called in Tel Aviv, or I guess we have to say now Jerusalem, rather than in the U.S. I mean, that seems like an absurd statement, but it's just a fact. You know, anybody who follows this closely, it's just... And that's something that Netanyahu understands very well. You know, they they are not going to nobody in the U.S. within the U.S. establishment in either political party. You know, uh, you know, with except or, exception of a few dissidents among the Democrats and maybe one on the Republican side, right, is is going to risk um, uh, the, the risk the appearance or uh, of of uh, failing to support Israel in the time of its greatest need. There's just no way. That's just not going to happen. They're, they're, they're going to, if it looks like Israel's like in the verge of, uh, of, of being, you know, not just pushed out of Lebanon, but of actually being invaded and being conquered by um, neighboring armies. If, if that, that seems like a real possibility, I think there really would be boots on the ground from the U S it's just that the commitment of the U S to Israel is, um, is serious, you know. This is uh, our commitment to the Zionist project is real, and it's it's not it's within the establishment, but it's also with in the base too. You know, as we've pointed out many times. Do you think that there will be people willing to sign up here in the U.S.? Lots of them. I mean, Christian oh, yeah. Zionism is a big force. It's true. Yeah, it's, and it's so, for it's for real. Yeah, I, I, I think, there think would that be. they would. So I mean, that might be what we were looking at. So there, we could actually be looking at potential boots on the ground because the way, the only way I, I keep on trying to play this scenario out in my mind, how this war is going to play out. Of course, we never know. Everybody's got cards up their sleeves that we can't see. We can't predict the future. But just everything seems to be stacked up against Israel. I mean, the, the, I just don't see Israel coming out on top in this. The more that they do, the more they're actually harming themselves. You know, what they've been doing, and they haven't been able to defeat Hamas. Uh, the IDF seems to be weak. It seems like the IDF even knows that they can't win this. Um, and their only hope is to bring in the United States. So I just feel like that they're, once this this really begins and they go in and we start to see body bags going sent back to Tel Aviv and into Haifa and the, all of a sudden, you know, the, the Hezbollah might be moving in and the Houthis could be uh, shooting rockets as well. And, and Iran, we're still waiting for Iran's retaliation. And obviously they got that support. And so I think there will become, there will be a point and it could be not in the too distant future that that Israel is really under the, the threat of collapsing where there are neighboring armies starting to pour into Israel. And at that yeah, point, like I, I, you said, like I, I, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there will be some, but I, it seems like diplomacy is just completely off the table. Uh -huh. And it doesn't seem like, I don't think Israel will be able to do this on their yeah. own. They're going to lose. Yeah. Well, and it then, seems, it's clear that Netanyahu is, has committed himself and he's committed his government, his country to a military solution. It's clear that he, you know, that uh, he has no interest in a diplomatic solution. You know, of course, you know, there was a ceasefire um, negotiations, but I think that was always a farce. It was just that he never had any interest in that. Uh, there was this um, Hochstein character, you know, uh, a, a U.S. Israeli dual citizen that was supposed to be negotiating with Hezbollah. But it was, it was clear that Israel had no interest there. 
this government is dedicated to a military solution. And there really isn't, you know, an alternative political force that would, um, that's a sufficient strength within Israel to pursue a different course at this point. So right now it looks like they are committed to a military solution, but it's a solution that they will fail to achieve. They just do not have the means to do it. So it, it's, it's really, when you think about it, it's a very reckless gamble. Um, you know, it's, it's, Again, you know, people have this, um, this, uh, this deep, deep faith in the U.S. You know, the U.S. was, uh, of course, a great victor, and well, it, it was on the Western side. It was a great victor. The Soviet Union was really the, the force that defeated the the German army in World War II. But they, you know, they came across as they were among the victors, and then became over time. You know, after the fall of the Soviet Union, the global hegemon. And so there's this belief that there's still, you know, you know, as we could see in Ukraine, you can also see it in Israel. It's just that there's nothing that the U.S. can't do. I think when the U.S. Yeah, I think when the U.S. sometimes tries to tell these countries now, well, uh, you know, we're basically out of those missiles. I'm, I'm sorry, we gave you everything we had. I think, like, what? Can you know, like Zelensky. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no. Zelensky, I don't think he really, he probably doesn't believe it. You know, it's just yeah. like the U.S. can do anything. And I yeah. think maybe, you know, Netanyahu has the same kind of idea. On the, so it's just like, we are going to, we're going to win this. You know, it's just like, uh, we're sort of like Britain and Churchill during World War II. Okay, we're holding out against this force, but we know... You know, we've got the Americans in the wreck. They're going to come in and they're going to win this for us. And that's what's going to happen. That's how this thing is going to end. You know, we're going to end victorious, you know, with the Americans at our sides. And then we'll get our greater Israel. We'll defeat Iran. We'll defeat Hezbollah once and for all. And it, this will be over. It's still and such will, a... Yeah. And I, you know, Netanyahu will go down. It's like the next, the the, um, the modern King David of, of Israel. It still seems like such a <laughs> stupid, short-sighted plan. Like even if you get you the U.S. in, and then U.S. boots are on the ground, and the U.S. is is bombing, you know, uh, Iran and, and Lebanon and Syria, all, all these these places. Like, what do you think is going to happen in the long run? That even if you bomb them to oblivion, you think that from then on, it's like there will be peace in the land? No, you'll just sown even more hatred. The few you can't kill everybody. And the more that the more that you kill, the more animosity you're building up against you, and that there will be further resistance. You're ensuring that there will always be this resistance to you. You know, the more that you do this, I just don't, I just don't see yeah, how the U.S. could like it, cause a victory. You know, right? Yeah, no, it's been a well, we've been uh, short-sighted. You know, it's just, and, and again. Um, but I think that's the calculation. You know, I, I guess that for people like Netanyahu, there's no alternative. If he stops right now, well, personally, you know, he'll probably end up in prison. His government will fall apart. Um, you know, he'll be s surrounded. Israel has already become a, a global pariah. Um, you know, people will say, you know, look, what, what have you done? What have you done? You know, we're now a lot worse off than when you started this campaign on, you know, after October 7th. Um, so it's just like things are, have clearly become worse. Israel's economy is in tatters. You know, it's, it's military forces worn down. It's failed to achieve its military objectives. You call it off right now and just it, you're admitting defeat. And that's something that, you know, a politician, a government just can't do. Um, it would be the smart thing to do is you just cut your losses. You you make it made a mistake, but you know again, look what's happening too in Ukraine. It's the same thing. It should have been if you had made a deal two years ago, you would have kept almost everything, right? If you made a deal a year ago, you you would have kept most of it. Uh, now make a deal ago. now, you'll just lose the the four um, oblasts and Crimea. But if you keep on fighting, you're going to probably end up losing all of Kharkov and Odessa and Nikolaev, and you know it'll. <laughs> But the the thing is that if they give in now, it just they admit that they made a huge mistake. So you just keep on saying, you know, these governments are on a losing side of a war, they um, they find it, I guess, just politically and maybe emotionally impossible to 
to accept it, to accept it defeat. So they always go for the, you know, the Hail Mary pass. They always go for the, you know, the, if somebody says, well, I have this plan, it looks pretty reckless and boy, you know, but if it succeeds, then we could, you know, we, we could just seize victory from the jaws of defeat. And then I'll go down as a hero and all, we, we could turn it all around. Right. I mean, if it's so there, it's actually the darkest, very similar. You think about yeah. it in both countries, they both Zelensky and Netanyahu. I think like Zelensky's victory plan, so called, basically is just to get the U.S. and NATO involved on his side. I think that actually, I think there was some recently a general or some high ranking Ukrainian official that was saying that, yeah, we know we can't win this war on our on our own. The only hope is to get NATO fighting with us. And and Netanyahu and Israel was thinking the same thing. So they're doing you know, their 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 victory plans, so called, are are I think really quite similar and very very dangerous. You know, for the for the region and for the world. Yeah, I, I hate that these these Netanyahu and Zelensky are using our country, you know, to gamble and just want to yeah. pull well, us we have in and just a uh, lot to blame. I mean, if we had just uh, been honest at the start, and you know, been prudent and and. Uh, and really thought about our own interests rather than, you know, it, it's our own sane, realistic, long-term interests. It banded the, you know, the neocon vision of that global hegemon. We we would be so much better off. But it was because we were whispering into his ear, you know, is that we've got your back. And we, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't doing it. <laughs> yeah, we were, that's right. It, yeah, it's not us. It's this. It's yeah. the, the political well, class. Well, can you can you talk about how these conflicts are going to really impact the the American people here, the U, the U.S.? Like, what does an Israeli defeat mean? I know I've I've kind of asked this question yeah. before, but I think well, again, I think again, it's just our ties to Israel are much deeper and um, kind of uh, are almost all religious. encompassing. Yeah, I mean, it's on many different levels. It's, you know, religious, social, uh, political, it's, and it's, it's very extensive, and it goes, and it goes way back. Um, so I, I think a defeat for Israel to suffer a real obvious defeat, you know, especially with U.S. involvement, it's going to have re repercussions, serious repercussions within this country. Um, and I can't really even foresee because the whole thing is so I find the whole phenomena of, you know, of Zionism, both Jewish Zionism and Christian Zionism and the subservience of the U.S. government to to Israeli interests is such a bizarre phenomenon without really any precedent in history. It's so irrational to begin with and um, that. But it's also so real. It's so, you know, it, it's it's so intense if when it is it suffers a really serious blow i don't know what the reaction is going to be but it's going to be substantial i think within this country it's not just going to be like a, a affect our uh foreign policy you know it's not like just a, some okay adjustments will be made in the state department and in the department of defense no this is something that's going to resonate or, you know echo throughout society and i but i'm not going to even pretend to to tell you how it's going to how it's going to, it may, to, just lead to it may lead to <laughs> some sort of real polarization like a you know o over the whole issue of israel you know and and um actually our you know relationship to the jews in general and it could lead to you know a, a real clash between philo-semitic and anti-semitic forces within this country but that's yeah, that's just a wild guess. I don't because it's just it's it's such a strange phenomenon. I don't think you can really apply the normal rules of logic to it because it really isn't very logical. But you think it could really tear this country apart? It could. Like I think it really could. I I think it, it's something that can because it is part of the fabric of the American identity. Strangely enough, it shouldn't be, you know. But it's just for a lot of people, part of being an American is also being committed to Israel. That's Weird. it's, it's so very strange. strange, but we know it's true. You know, here we live in the South, and you can see it. And yeah. then, in, you know, but it's not just the South; it's in New York City. You know, I mean, New York City Jews. There's, it's it's something that's it's it's you know that you find in American society in different regions and in different levels and uh, you know of, of of government and yeah, um, you know, it's strange. You know, it's it's not something I really ever noticed or thought about when I was a kid or growing up, but. Now they've become aware of the situation. It's true. I see it. Just the other day, I saw there was a car and it had this sticker with the Israeli flag and the American flag crossed, you know, 
um, and I saw a truck with a uh, an American Eagle, and it was like a, a shirt, and it was like torn open, and but behind it was the Israeli flag in, with the American Eagle. I'm like, what is yeah. this? This is so right. strange. Why? Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, that's that's emblematic of what I'm saying right there. It's it's for real though. And then for you know, you talk about um, Ukraine. It's the the commitment is really. You know, you obviously find individuals, uh, you know, like this uh, poor, uh, like this nut that attempted the assassination of the golf course, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that people are very passionate about Ukraine. But that's, they're, they're, you know, they're the exception to the rule. It's just there's not a, a, anything um, analogous to what you see on the, is, on the Israeli side. Know the the, the the support for Israel and Zionism is real, and it's and it's widespread. You know the support for Ukraine exists, but it's actually quite minimal outside of the political establishment. You know, outside of the State Department, for example, and you know, and um, the Defense Department, but mainly the State Department. Um, so you know, a defeat in in um, in Ukraine. Would certainly send shockwaves, you know, but it would be shockwaves really with uh, within the political establishment and and through governments around the world, you know, who would see this and it it would have real consequences, no question about it. But it it's not going to affect the American psyche the way that a defeat in Israel could. Yeah, I think the end of Israel could spell the end of America. It will spell the end of America as we know it. As we know, we know it, yeah. Right? It exactly. doesn't mean obviously America is going to be around, but I mean it, it will be a different. Yeah, it, it will be a different but America. It, it needs, right. it needs right. to end. We need to right. get rid of this parasitic relationship yeah. that we have with, with no, Israel. It's a very, very so. unhealthy relationship. You know, that's uh, it hasn't done us any good. Right. In the it's, end, it hasn't done Israel well. If if a long time ago we had made it clear to them, hey, you know. You're going to have to make peace with your neighbors. If you get in a war, you're on your own. That would have changed everything. That would have, you know, Netanyahu might not be prime minister today. Mm -hmm. It would be the, it would be the pro peace forces and whatever would would have a leg up. You know, they would be. Um, it's just that you know it's similar again to what happened in in Ukraine. It's just that these the maximalist militaristic forces are empowered by this U.S. relationship because they can say, they can go and tell their people that, yeah, we have the U.S. at our back. Right. Um, and if, but if they can't tell them that, people look and say, like, what are you doing? You're crazy. You're picking a war, you know, with Russia? You know, what? You're going to pick a war with the whole Middle East? You know, let's, we, we got to work something out, man. You know, it's... Yeah, yeah I, I think it, it's interesting that, you know, here, a phenomenon that's in the Western world is that there's a lot of guilt for past sins. You know, this, there's a lot of self-flagellation and there's ideas of, you know, paying compensation to past crimes. You know, we, we should do, uh, you know, that, that whole idea of, you know, like, what, what's, it, what's it called again? I'm losing the term. What are you, to, to pay black people for and reparations? Uh, reparations, right, right. Yeah. The idea of like paying reparations and these things they gain prominence. But within Israeli society, there's no guilt at all. And it's very, and it's not that, and it's pretty recent, you know, I mean, it's, it is, it's ongoing, you know, what, what they did to the Palestinians, kicked them all out and pushed them all out. But there's no sense of that guilt, like, oh, we're sorry that we've done this. And maybe now we should atone for our sins and we can get along and, you know, the crimes of the, uh, of our fathers, you know, we, we, mm -hmm. there, there's no semblance of that at all. But, but these, the, the, the people that live in, in Israel are, they're, they're, they're Europeans, they're Americans, they're Canadians, and these countries all have this sense of, of guilt and, and this idea that we need to pay reparations and atone for the sins, but you don't get that at all in Israel. Why, why is that? Why is, why is there no that, <laughs> that feeling of like we did something wrong to the people that lived here? You know, we always have that here in the United States about the indigenous people that lived here right. in America and yeah. the well, European yeah. countries, their yeah. colonies, you know. But Yeah. Yeah. Um... Well, I, I would, you know, I would describe it. Uh, maybe I'll get myself in trouble if I start going down that road. But, okay. Uh, we don't want to get banned from YouTube. Well, we'll so. just say it's for re real. I mean, there's, um, well, it's clear that Jewish Israelis, okay, actually don't, you know, they consider themselves as, as a very distinct ethnicity. You know, it's sort of like we have this tendency to think like, oh, they're just sort of one of us, part of our, but there, there is, I think they have a very distinct um, sense of identity 
and that has um, uh, yeah that differs markedly you know from the general white sense of identity and you know one of the ways that it differs markedly is it just doesn't have the sense of guilt um, you know it's actually openly supremacist uh, so much of it now um, you know before maybe it was covertly supremacist but now it's openly supremacist you know you get people talking like that all the time in Israel and it's just you know you, you may not know about it if you're watching mainstream media but you're watching any other sort of you're you know you're out there on social media you just hear these comments all the time that you could only for coming from US uh, not US but Israeli government officials and you can only describe it as supremacist I guess yeah, it makes sense. I mean, yeah, I just kind of was thinking that you know they're they they come from these cultures and societies in Europe and the United yeah. States that, and, but they they have their own unique identity that's within. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I stuff. just was. I remember being very. I think I've mentioned this at least once before, but you know when I went to Israel and uh, Palestine in 2011. Um, you know, I came, I grew up in Berkeley and um, surrounded by a lot of mostly secular Jews. You know, some of my, my two very best friends were you know, actually secular Jews, one half Jewish, one fully Jewish. And, you know, I was, I always associated um, these people with uh, a, a real zealous commitment to, to diversity um, and to, you know, things like high levels of immigration, you know, who have... Uh, and I assumed that that when I got to Israel, that I would find a kind of a country full of these sort of people. That's not what I found. I mean, we've met a few of those people, but they were few and far between. You had to get on a bus and travel 50 miles to find one of them. You know, they were a tiny minority within Israel. And then I understood that, wait a second, it's like this commitment to to multiculturalism and diversity is was for white people, but it wasn't for Jewish people. And that's something that the Jews themselves understood. I mean, that's, again, there are, there are honorable exceptions, you know, and we met those people. Um, but by and large, that's something, is, yeah, that's something that, 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 that white people in the U.S. and Europe, they have to do, you know, but, hey, but this is not something that is required of us. We are a separate, you know, it's, it's, that's not part of the treatment that we receive. You know, we can be, frankly, you know, openly, we can be supremacist. Because we're not we're not being supremacists as white people, we're being supremacists as Jews, and there's sort of a separate standard there. I mean, this is, you know, maybe getting into dangerous territory, but I think it's just true. That's what I've observed. It's such a fascinating, almost fantastical problem situation that we have here. It's such it's it's so crazy that this this this, re, this relationship that Israel has with the United States and how they control the, the United States and that that our country might really get destroyed, break apart from, from what Israel is doing. And we just can't say no to it. And I, I just, I, I can't wrap my head around it. Yeah. It's just, I can't, yeah, every become, time we talk yeah. about it, I'm just like, right. really, it's unbelievable. Yeah. No, like, it wow, is what well, is quite, it's very hard to, but it's just for real. I mean, you just think about it again. It wasn't too long ago that Netanyahu was at our Congress and yeah, what was it in July? Of yeah. Right. And one of them so, lasted for more than a minute. Yeah, uh, like, yeah, I finally had to even tell him to stop clapping because he couldn't get it. <laughs> you know, there's no other foreign leader that gets. So it's it's not like you know we're exaggerating anything at all. You almost you can't exaggerate it. That's that's what's it's, that's what's it's happening in this country. It's really incredible. Right. It's really incredible how this, and I just, I, I just how so many people. It, it, how did it happen that the so many people in America they just grew up, they were raised to say that. Yeah, you know, America and Israel were two peas in a pod. We have to be because it's uh -huh. it's so strong. I encounter it a lot here, and and you know, it makes it yeah. difficult to have conversations with people around. I, I usually don't because I don't know where. Yeah. I I know a lot of people where they stand on this issue um, does not jive with my, my view of, of the situation. Yeah, right. Um, but it's right. just how I'm like, you guys are Christians, right? Why? Why? What? Yeah, what? Right. <laughs> the, 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 yeah. the, they, they, these people believe that they, they spit on Christians and they believe that Christ is burning in excrement in hell for, you know, why, why do you yeah. have such a love for them? I mean, you should love your neighbor regardless. You know, I don't have right. any hatred to, towards, towards anybody unless they've done something personal to me, you know, and so, but why do you have this undying commitment and this idea that Muslims are the problem yeah. that, uh, yeah. 
Well, yeah, we, we well we've had you know, our earlier episode on um, on Christian Zionism, which has yeah. its own unique history. And I think it's important to understand it's a history that's actually separate from Jewish Zionism. It's not like I kind of assumed it was like, and I think there's some truth to this, that it's, you know, uh, influential Jewish Zionists kind of misleading um, global Christians and taking them down this path. And there may be some of that. But if you look at the history of Christian Zionism, it's something that that rose within the Protestant churches in this country and in the UK and um, and grew kind of organically within uh, within these churches. And it, it's a very strange phenomenon, but it's very real with very real consequences. So you get these people, but then also, you know, you get equally strong statements from people that have nothing to do with Christian Zionism that are, you know, I was thinking Nancy Pelosi said, like, they've even like the whole capital burns to the ground. You know, one thing that will remain is our devotion to the state of Israel or or Joe Biden saying that there's just no daylight between us and Israel. I won't let there be any. You know, it's just it, it's the same level of fanaticism. You know, it, 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 but it's there. It's 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 just it's kind of, you know, interwoven in our society and our political system. Well, it's going to destroy our system. I mean, I, I, I firmly believe it because yeah. Israel... It's I already not... done a great deal of damage. And it, right. Yeah, and, I, think and, I think you're right. And the, this war that's kicking off, you know, people just, like we said, asked the question in the beginning, what's different about this war to previous uh, Israeli wars? You know, this one, I think Israel will lose, have a devastating defeat. And I think it's going to tear America apart. The What you've told me, how we've explained it, I think... A, this is this is going to just really rip the fabric of uh, of the U.S. Um, and 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 it needs to. I mean, maybe that's the only way you can. I mean, if if Zionism is is infiltrated every level of our society, um, and it's when it dies, you know that it's going to have huge repercussions throughout every level of society here in the United States. And yeah, I can't. We don't know what exactly is going to happen, but it has to happen. It will happen. It is happening. And let's just pray that it doesn't end with millions and millions of dead people. You know, because that's a possibility. Okay. Well, Dad, we'll end on that happy note then. Okay. Um, okay. Happy Friday. Happy, happy Friday. Okay. Have a good weekend. You okay, too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.